Bruchem Aboim, again, welcome to our home. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, tonight is going to be, again, last week we talked about the signs that Moses, Moshe, and Rabbeinu brought on, uh, on Egypt. Uh, for the next two weeks, what I'd like to deal with is understanding the plagues uh, that um, Moshe and Aaron and God brought on the Egyptians in Egypt for they freed the Jewish nation. So this week, on my thoughts, I would like to examine more closely the ten plagues that God Almighty brought upon Pharaoh and the Egyptian people and why he did so. You know, the first question that comes to mind is why is it that only the tenth plague, what we call Makos Bechoros, the killing of the firstborn, is referred to as a Mako, a plague, whereas all the other miracles that God Almighty performed through Moshe and Aaron that they, in Egypt are referred to with only one word, blood, frogs, lice, etc. Whereas the other nine events are, are weren't, weren't the other nine events also considered plagues? So why aren't they called Makos Dam, Makos uh, Tzfardea? Why just one word? We read in the portion of Exodus that God Almighty revealed to Moshe, even before he began his mission to redeem the children of Israel from, from Egypt, that Pharaoh would refuse to let the Jews go free. In the end, Moshe says to Pharaoh, in God's name, that since you refuse to let my firstborn son go free, well, behold, I will slay your son, your firstborn. The Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson of Blessed Memory, stated that the ten plays were unique, not only in their manner, but also <laughs> in their purpose. The first nine plagues were brought upon the Egyptians, not so much as a form of punishment, but more so as a form of education. As it states in Exodus, in this you shall know that I am the Lord. However, the tenth plague was not meant to be instructional. The tenth plague was brought upon the Egyptians to punish and destroy them for their sins. And if we read in Exodus that God instructs the children of Israel to place the blood of their paschal offering on their lintels and doorposts. In, ad in addition, he instructs them that you shall not go out anyone from his house until morning. Rashi commenting on this verse states, This tells us that after permission has been given to the destroyer to do injury, he does not differentiate between the righteous and the wicked. This Rashi confirms the fact that the first nine events that were brought in Egypt could not have been administered as a punishment. After all, if they were plagues, then the Jews should not, pardon me, should have been commanded to sequester themselves in their houses during each of these nine plagues. However, that was not the case. It was only with the tenth plague, the killing of the firstborn, that the Jews were commanded not to leave their houses until morning. And we read in connection with the tenth plague that the accusing forces asked God Almighty, what is the difference between the Jews and the Egyptians in that they are both idolaters? This then created a special need, a sign that would protect the children of Israel from the forces of strict justice. Our sages tell us that a person who was saved from a disaster by virtue of their own merit is then permitted to watch as a disaster befalls those that are being punished. However, a person who was being saved in some merit other than their own is then forbidden to watch as their neighbor falls. That is the reason why the angel who saved Lot and his family from the destruction of Sodom told them as he was escorting them out of the city in the portion of Vayera, do not look back. Well, we witnessed that Lot's wife did not heed the angel's warning. She looked back and she paid the price. She was transformed into a pillar of salt. Similarly, the children, since the children of Israel were tainted with many sins, which included idolatry, they were forbidden to watch as the plague of the firstborn struck the Egyptians. Well, that being the case, they were compelled for their own safety to stay sequestered in their houses. So the question that we must ask is, how could a sign answer the claims of the accusing forces? The answer given is that the tenth plague was executed by God Almighty himself, and that he is over and above the attribute of strict justice. This then is also the connection between the tenth plague and the hour of midnight, when God killed all the firstborn in Egypt. 
since midnight is the time that the all-transcending face of God is revealed. Our sages tell us that midnight is the time that brings together the two halves of the night. The first half, which goes from light to darkness, symbolizes severity. The second half of the night, which goes from darkness to light, symbolizes kindness. So at midnight, both of these opposing forces coexisted, that being the case. Then during the 10th plague, both of these forces would have been in play at the exact same moment of time. Severity for the Egyptians and kindness for the Jews. The kindness that was extended to the Jews was an unconditional love, since only an unconditional love could have saved them from the same fate that befell the Egyptians. So again, why was there a need for a sign? So we learned that even unconditional love, which always exists above, still requires some action from below in order to draw it down and allow it to reveal itself. That act must be unconditional. So now we can also better understand why there was a necessity for two signs of blood, the blood of circumcision and the blood of the Paschal offering that were placed on their doorpost. The B'nai Yisusker stated that the Paschal offering and circumcision are the only two cases in the entire Torah where intentional failure to perform a positive commandment carries with it the most severe punishment in Torah, what we refer to as karis, excision of the soul. But why? He answers that it was in the merit of these two mitzvot that the children of Israel were redeemed from their oppressive slavery. It was then that they forged an unbreakable bond with God Almighty, their Father in Heaven, forever. Therefore, anyone who intentionally ignores these two commandments is cut off, both from life and from their nation. It is as if they had never left Egypt. Circumcision is an act that is done on the eighth day after the birth of a healthy baby boy, a time that precedes any logic that could be formed, an act that goes beyond any reason. This was also true of the Paschal offering, which the children of Israel were commanded to bring as a sacrifice on the night of the 15th of Nisan. The sheep, the astrological sign of Ares, was the god that the Egyptians worshipped. You know, the children of Israel were commanded by God Almighty to take a sheep on the 10th of the month of Nisan and to tie it to their bedpost. So that for four days, for four days they kept the sheep, the god of the Egyptians, in their homes. Then, on the night of the 15th, they roasted it on a spit in full view of their Egyptian masters. This was a true demonstration of Mesira Snefish, self-sacrifice. Our sages tell us that the act of self-sacrifice is always viewed as an act over and above the realm of logic. So the nation of Israel was forced to stay in their houses only for the duration of this plague. No other, since this was the only plague brought upon the Egyptians as a punishment. That being the case, during the killing of the firstborn, the forces of destruction were given free reign to destroy, as I mentioned earlier. Once permission is granted for them to destroy, they have make no distinction between those that are righteous and those that are evil. Well, the Jews stayed home. Since God knew that Pharaoh would not let the children of Israel go until he would bring the plague of the firstborn, what was the reason that he brought the other nine plagues? So the morale of Prague stated the reason that God Almighty brought the ten plagues on the Egyptians was to show the world that he was the same God who had created the world with ten sayings. In the process of creating this world, God took upon himself the ten spherot, what we refer to again, ten character traits, which also allude to the Ten Commandments. These ten plagues were to show the world that he controls all aspects of nature. Not only was there a significance in the number of plagues, but also in their precise order. The physical world can be divided into three levels. The bottom level, which consists of earth and water. The middle level, which consists of man and animals and the top level, which consists of the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets. The first three plagues showed God's dominion over the bottom level of creation. The plagues of blood and frogs affected the water, 
and the plague of lice affected the dust of the earth. The second set of three plagues demonstrated God's dominion over the middle level of creation, wild beasts, pestilence, and boils, which affected both people and animals. <clears throat> the third set of three plagues showed God's dominion over the top level of creation, hail, locusts, and darkness, which all come from above. The tenth plague showed God's control over something even loftier than all three levels of the physical world. It expressed his control over the human soul, representing his control over the entire metaphysical world. The plagues were divided into threes, which also have a significance. You know, the numbers one, two, and three all have deep philosophical meanings. The number one represents unity, oneness, and divinity. The number two represents expansion and diversity. And the number three represents the point where diversity of the two embraces an underlying common theme which unites them together. Each set of the three plagues followed this pattern, with the first two plagues representing opposing occurrences and the third plague representing an occurrence that blended the first two together. This is the reason why only the first two plagues of each group were preceded by a warning. Now, this was not the case with the third, since the third plague was a synthesis of the earlier two plagues, it did not warrant the verbalization of a new warning. So, based on this concept, we can now understand the plagues on a totally different level. Concerning the first three plagues, blood, which is a hot liquid, frogs inhabit cool water, hot and cold represent polar opposites, lice grow in warm, damp places, which represent a fusion of hot and cold. God showed his full control over hot, cold, and everything in between. Wild animals appearing suddenly in inhabited areas and killing people is an unnatural occurrence. However, animals dying from pestilence is really quite natural. So these two events represent polar opposites, and boils represent a middle point between the two. Boils are not an everyday occurrence, but they are not extraordinary either. So God Almighty showed his full control over the entire spectrum of events that occur in life, the ordinary, the extraordinary, and everything in between. Hail origin originates in the heavens and then falls to the ground. Locusts fly from the ground to the sky. Again, these two are polar opposites. Darkness occurs when the sun is obscured, the sun being something that, to the naked eye, travels from the earth to the sky and then back again, expressing a fusion of the previous two plagues. So this third set of plagues express God's control over the entire motion spectrum of this world. Now the tenth plague represented God's control over the metaphysical world, illustrated by his taking the souls of the Egyptian firstborn. So maybe the lesson that we can learn from the plagues, even today, is that when we run into difficulties, challenges in our lives, maybe they were placed there to be a sort of wake-up call. Maybe it's time for us to stop, to look, and to listen. There are times in our lives when God, our Father in heaven, tries to encourage us to stop and take an accounting of where we are at the present moment. You know, we need to look. We need to take an honest assessment of our goals and motivation. And most of all, most of all, we need to listen, not talk. I find it interesting that the English words listen and silent both have the exact same letters. We should always make an effort to listen more than we speak, especially when we are in the company of those who have what to teach us. I would hope that you find this lecture interesting, another way for us to understand the plagues that God Almighty brought on Egypt on a much deeper level. This, of course, then connects with Passover, the one holiday that is celebrated by more Jews than any other holiday to include the high holidays. God is willing, God willing, next week, I would like to continue with a further discussion on the plagues and how all of this connects to our everyday lives. Let me end with a prayer to God Almighty that he releases the hostages safely, cures the injured, consoles the mourners, 
and protects those IDF soldiers and civilians that are in harm's way with the coming of Mashiach Sakana quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for listening. And again, if there's anything you can do as far as prayer or money in any way to help, again, our brethren in Israel, uh, please do so. And again, let me ask you please to subscribe and to push like and to share if you can. And that would be greatly appreciated. God bless, be well, stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy. Again, God should bless you with all that's good. Shabbat Shalom and thank you for listening. Uh, there will be a musical rendition of so an original song right after this presentation. Thank you very much.